We tried to get Ludacris here, but he wasn't available. Um, I think he wanted to come, though. I don't know. But would you guys agree that the world has a lot of things to say about what it means to be a champion? I mean, there's lots of messages like that in the world that aren't necessarily bad. In fact, they're kind of cool. But the world has an idea of what it means to be a champion. And I feel for us as a church, we need to recapture the idea of what it means to be a champion. Because the Bible tells us that in Christ, we are champions. We are. And, and, I'll, and I'll show you, actually, Paul writes this. Um, it's written all over Scripture, but in, in Romans chapter 8, Paul says it in a way that I think is really helpful. Chapter 8, verse 37, he says, But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. That, that's good news. Okay, and, and I'd encourage you in that word, there's a word we're going to highlight today. It's the word we. Notice the difference between the world and the word. See, the world says I, the word says we. See, see, Jesus came, he overwhelmingly conquered. He's given that victory to us, but he's not given it to just you or me. He's given it to us. We overwhelmingly conquer together. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today over the next four weeks today and in, in, in the next four weeks, we're going to look at this idea of champion. And, and most weeks, I have to be honest with you, most weeks when, when God sits me down and we start working on the message, usually it's on a day um, like Monday. Okay? And usually I've got a pretty good idea of where we're going for the year, but I have no idea where we're going for this week. Does that make sense? Like I, I know where we're going, but sometimes on Monday morning I open up my Bible and open up the laptop and I go, okay, God, we need you. Because <laughs> sometimes that's how it works. And most weeks he'll give me maybe a week at a time. Sometimes I don't get it till Wednesday, but a lot of times it happens on Monday, which is good. But this week God just kept talking. I kept opening up the Bible and it just like the words and the ideas kept jumping off the page. And pretty soon I'm writing and writing and writing. And pretty soon I'm like, wait a second. Like we only have like 30 minutes on Sunday. This is like three hours of material. <laughs> And it was like God was saying, this is something that we need to spend some time in. So it was going to be three weeks. We just added on a couple weeks on the end because I really think God needs to speak into our lives on this whole idea of being a champion and living out of a place of victory. So what we're going to do over the next four weeks, we're going to talk about four concepts. If you want to write these down, you can, um, but this is just where we're headed. Number one, we're going to talk about rallying because champions rally together. It's what we do on Sundays. We come and we rally into one place. Every champion needs a team. Think about the superheroes, okay? I'm not a superhero guy, but I do know enough to know that they form like a league, like the Justice League. What's the other one? The Avengers? There's some other ones out there that I'm missing. Um, but even superheroes need teams. We, we, we have teams. We work together. So we rally. The second thing we do, we'll talk about it this week a little bit and next week, is that we unite. See, it's one thing to gr draw a crowd. It's another thing to build an army. And in order to rally a, a crowd, the next step is then we have to unite. We have to unite under the banner of Christ. And that's what we're going to be doing this week and next week. The third step is a little bit counterintuitive, but it's very important. And I think a lot of people miss this when it comes to the church. The third step after we rally, unite, the third step is we need to surrender. We need to surrender our rights to our Lord, to our King. Not, not to me. Okay. We need to surrender to our Lord and to his church, to his mission. We need to rally, unite, surrender. And the last step is my favorite one. We need to fight. We need to fight. Many of you who grew up, maybe, maybe you grew up going to basketball games or football games, the cheerleaders would often do a cheer. You guys finish it if you know it. I think we've got some cheerleaders. At the first service, we actually had a cheerleader here. It was awesome. Um, she was in uniform and everything. Um, but we say, go fight, right? Go fight, win. That's what the world says. And I need to tell you, that's backwards. That's backwards because as children of God, we've already won. We're called to go and fight. So if you want to sing the Christian cheer, we need to sing it, win, go, fight. Okay? You guys got that? It's going to be a little shift. We're going to talk about what the world says, or what the word says, not what the word says. Not what the world says. I'm sorry, I totally messed that up. 
Because I see Christians who tend to trend towards a loser's mindset. And it looks like this. Got to go to church. Oh, I wish it, you know, I wish I could have the weekend free. There's a lot of Christians that walk around and suck their thumb and stick their lip out. And I'm just telling you, that is not the form of Christianity that's in the Bible. I don't know where you find it, but it's not Jesus. Okay? The Jesus that I worship is going to come back and he's going to set the world straight. He's going to come riding in and everybody's going to know it. Okay? He is Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And he's in charge. Okay? And, and we need to live from that because so oftentimes we don't win, we'd rather whine. It's a very human tendency. And so we're going to talk about this because last week we talked about having our minds or, or being transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so when it comes to this idea of how we live, we need to have our minds renewed. And so we're going to count on God's word to do that because if we're going to win, it begins within. We can't win any victories out here until we've won the battle within. This would be a really good time for somebody to say amen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Or not. I mean, you can't fight a battle out here if you haven't won it out here. You have to make a decision to be a champion before you ever get out on the field. I know lots of champions who never won a contest on the field. Okay. In fact, we're going to read from Paul today, and Paul's writing about being a champion from behind prison bars. The world says that he lost, but the word said that he won. And we're going to talk about that. And so what's, over the next four weeks, I'm going to ask you to make a, a decision. And I'm going to ask you a question. Please don't respond. Please don't shout out. Are you in? Okay. Are you in for the next four weeks as we talk about this journey? Are, are you willing to say, hey, I'll show up, I'll rally together as we unite for the cause? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to make a commitment and making a priority to be here over the next four weeks? It's not very often that I ask this of you, but I think it's important because I know we've got stuff going on, okay? I've got stuff going on, okay? We all have stuff going on. But here's what I'd ask you to do. As far as it's possible with you, would you consider making a, you don't have to make it public in any way, although that could help, um, but, but if, you, if you just make a decision, hey, I want to be here for the next four weeks, because we're going to unpack this, this idea of being a champion and winning within, I'm going to ask you to consider that. And so um, we'll talk a little bit more uh, throughout the service, but the question, what is a champion? Here's what the world says. In the, in the dictionary, it says this. Number one definition, a person who has defeated or surpassed all rivals. A person who has defeated or surpassed all rivals. They're a winner, a victor, a conqueror. That's what the world says. Someone who has beat the competition. That's what the world says. Here's what the word says. It, it's the context of verse 37 in chapter 8. Verse 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes or prays for us. Who will separate us from his love? The love of Christ will tribulation, distress, persecution, mortgage, famine, nakedness, peril, a sword, just as it is written. Here's the part that the world doesn't like to hear. And so I'm giving you a kind of a spoiler alert here. This is going to be a little painful. Here it is. As it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. It's not a very encouraging picture. But let's lay in verse 37. Here it comes. Let's say it together. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. 
see, I don't know what you're facing today. I know what some of you are facing. Some of you know what some of the others are facing. But we can pretty much put our life between the brackets of tribulation, nakedness, and peril. Okay, It's probably somewhere in between there. You're going through a trial. You're going through a struggle. Whatever is happening, we overwhelmingly conquer through him. Through him who loved us. And that's a champion. That's a winner. So right now, if you're in Christ, I want you to turn to someone and say, I'm a winner. Okay, Go ahead. Own it. I'm a winner. I'm a winner. Okay, If you're in Christ, you're a winner. You need to talk to yourself like that because sometimes we've got to pep ourselves up. How many people are maybe in a workout program starting the new year? Any of you in a workout program? Wow, you guys are really, okay. (laughs) I know some of you are. (laughs) Um, But you got to pump yourself up sometimes, don't you? (laughs) Like, we can do this. Let's do it, right? You gotta, you gotta remind yourself. Martin Luther used to do this. He said, I used to preach the gospel to myself, okay? Because he, he, he was fighting an uphill battle back in his day, a couple 500 years ago. He, he had to preach the gospel to himself, and we need to do that too. You are a winner. Turn to somebody else and say, you're a winner, okay? Here, it's not just the New Testament, the Isaiah 54. He's prophesying to, the, to, to our spiritual ancestors, He says this, but in that coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. See, Isaiah is reminding us that we've won. Even though it doesn't look good, I want to remind you of what Coach Sweeney said from Clemson. The least important thing is the score at halftime. And if you're here today, it might not be halftime, but there's still some game to be played. You might be in the first quarter. You might be in the third quarter. But you know what's not important? The scoreboard. Okay? Especially when you're living the Christian life because we've already won. Here's the second definition of a champion. The first one is a winner. The second one is this. One who fights for a cause. A champion is one who fights for for a cause, an advocate, a supporter, a standard bearer, a defender, a protector, a sponsor, an apostle, an evangelist, or a missionary. Those are synonyms for a champion. Martin Luther King Jr. was a champion for civil rights and racial reconciliation. He championed that cause. Abraham Lincoln championed the cause of unity within our country. He, he, He fought for that cause. You may have heard of of Thomas Paine. He he said these words, give me liberty or give me death. Thomas Paine championed the cause of liberty. Here's what I find interesting about champions. Champions often give their lives for the cause that they fight for. Martin Luther King did. Abraham Lincoln did. Many men and women have given their lives to protect what Thomas Paine spoke. Give me liberty or give me death. Many men and women have given their lives so that you and I have this freedom today. You see, a champion is someone who fights for a cause. And if we're going to live as Christians, we need to get a hold of this idea. Not only have we won, and that's awesome, but we also need to fight. We need to rally, unite, surrender, and fight. So if you're coming today, maybe you weren't expecting to hear that I was going to ask you to start fighting, but you need to get your mind ready. Okay, this, this isn't a cruise ship, okay? This is an aircraft carrier, okay? God has called us to a life in him that's going to require us to fight and defend his cause. That's what champions do. That's what they do. They give their lives. So we're going to look at what Paul does, and, and if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them to Philippians chapter 1. We're, we're going to look at his letter to the church, and we're going to pull out just a couple of nuggets from this letter that he writes. Chapter 1, verse 3, he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now, being confident of this, champions are confident 
being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Champions rally. They rally confidently around Christ. And they understand that their championship isn't their own doing. It's the work of Christ in them who's bringing it to completion. Champions in the world are set aside as people that have earned something. Champions in the kingdom are set aside as one as ones who God has crowned champion. We, we get to do it. We get to win through him. We get to win. And here's the first mindset. If you have your notes, this is a fill-in. Champions fight from victory, not for it. This is the mindset that a champion has in Christ. They're not fighting to win a battle. The battle has already been won. Champions in Christ fight from victory, not for it. It changes everything. It allows us to slow it down just a little bit, to take stock in who we are, and then we can express that to others. We fight from victory. Okay? Somebody walks in today, throws the cuffs on me and says, we've changed some rules, no longer can you preach the gospel in the United States. It's illegal. Which, which is not that far away. <laughs> it's not that far away. In chains, we still win. We still win. No matter what the government says, no matter what the White House says, no matter what Congress says, we win. In Christ, we win. We fight from victory, not for it. Verse 7, he goes on, It's right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ. Do you notice the teamwork in that passage? He's talking about sharing. He's talking about affection and feelings. You see, if we're going to do this thing called life, if we're going to be the body of Christ, we need to understand that it's a team effort. At the bottom of your notes, there's three little initials, DNA, I'm going to give those to you right now. DNA, Christian DNA, do nothing alone. We're a team. We do it together. Paul's communicating this. Even though they were separate in the body, they're one in the spirit. And our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is in the spiritual realm against the spiritual forces of this dark world. We've got a battle to fight, and it's not the kind of battle that you think. <laughs> it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. And it takes teamwork. Now I want to take a second and just talk about championships because um, um, I grew up in a little town called Max, North Dakota. Okay? Population 300. Um, I always like to see who's ever been to Max. Yeah, a couple. Okay, yeah. yeah. See, more and more. It's catching on. We had three at the first service. So some of you, you know, if you're still working on your bucket list, you might want to put a place on there for Max, North Dakota. Okay? We've got Mean Jeans Burgers at the Senex there. So you can actually get a Mean Jeans Burger. Okay, anyway. Um, so Max, North Dakota, that's where I'm from. When I grew up, the sun uh, rose and set in the Red River Valley. Everything revolved around Fargo and North Dakota State. And so as a little boy, uh, I had an uncle who played there. He played there before World War II. He went to war, was thrown in a prison camp, got out, came back and played two more years at NDSU. So... I was kind of like, in my mind, I'm like, this is my destiny, you know? It's what I wanted to do. It's what I loved. And so God was gracious. He gave me an opportunity to go there to school, uh, to play football there. I played for five years, um, started for four years, um, got to be a part of an unbelievable tradition. And for those of you that aren't up on the tradition, um, 15 national titles since 1965, 15. 35 conference championships, Division II record 35 and 12 in the playoffs, um, and then in the last eight years of Division I, they're 31 and 2 in the playoffs. Okay, so that's some championship culture. And a lot of people say, Oh, you played at NDSU? I'm like, Yeah. How many championships did you win? Zero. <laughs> you see, when I was there, uh, the level of players was down a little bit. <laughs> so I was there for five years. We didn't win anything, we didn't win a national title or a conference title. 
but I was a part of a culture that had won and then would use those same principles to go on and win some more. But here's the cool part about it. I did win, actually. I met, I met Dana there. And so I walked away with the biggest trophy that they had. It was Dana. And so I always tell people that's what I wanted when I was in DSU. But um, the reality is this. On the walls, in the locker room, all over, they've got this saying. It says this, the strength of the herd is the bison, and the strength of the bison is the herd. Champions know that we are better together. I think, I, think, I think the church needs to take notes on this one because we are better together than we are apart. The, the way that bison gets separated, the way that they get attacked by whether it's, by whether in the day it was by you know, the, the Lakota or, or, or wolves, they would separate the weak ones, the old ones, or the slow ones. They'd separate them from the herd and then they could surround them and devour them. That's exactly what the enemy wants to do to you and wants to do to me. The strength of the herd is the bison. The strength of the bison is the herd. The strength of the church is Jesus Christ. And we need to stay together as part of his body. Every person here matters. Everyone matters. We are one body with many parts. And we need to get a hold of that reality. We need to rally together. Partnership in the gospel is essential. Many people have a confidence that they've won, but they forget that it involves others. As champions, Paul's telling us we need to bond together. We need to love each other with the humility and grace that God has given us. Winning championships is not about chest beating. It's about back padding. It's about encouragement. Okay? Champions don't do this. Champions do this. Go ahead and put your arm around somebody. Give them a pat on the back. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think there's some people here that need a pat on the back. There's some people. You know what? There's some people that are sitting alone. That's not okay. We're stopping the show here, okay? Come on, Ron, come on. We got we to gotta have people sitting together. We can't have people sitting alone. So anybody else? Who wants to sit? Aaron, come on over here. We can't have people sitting alone. You're not alone? Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Can you guys slide together? Come on. Carissa, you come slide back here with Jennifer. Jennifer, slide down. We've got to be together, okay? We can't be apart. We have to be together. This is what champions do. We don't come. When you come to celebrate, when you come to church and you see someone sitting by themselves, I'm telling you, unless you want to get in trouble, go sit by them. Introduce yourself. Make a new friend. That's what we do. We are one body, many parts. There's no solo... There's no solo activities. We do everything together. DNA, do nothing alone. Do nothing alone. It's so important. Now, put your arm around somebody and give them a pat on the back, okay? We don't do this. We do this. Okay, I'm watching. I'm looking for somebody that's not patting somebody on the back. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Good, good. Okay, no cheating. No cheating. I'm going to watch for this. We're going to throw a flag on this, okay? It's like illegal formation in church, okay? If you want to use a football analogy, we, we'll throw a flag on it. And you're here today. We didn't say this to the first service, so let's mess with them, okay? <laughs> Don't let anybody sit alone. Don't do it. Put your arm around somebody. That's what champions do. Here's, here's mind shift number two. The first one was we fight from victory, not for it. Here's the second one. I don't even know if this is in your notes, but you've got to write this down. Champions fight for people, not against people. See, our competition isn't with anyone in this room or anyone outside this room. Our battle is a spiritual one. The fight's not here. If you're walking through life today and you're like this towards someone in your life, guess what? You're wrong. We, we, we put our hands down like this. What did Jesus do on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Okay, that's our standard. That's our standard. I sometimes wish that the standard was punch him. I think that's what Peter was thinking, right? Peter, it's gotten tense, right? What did Peter do? He whipped out the sword. I'm sure he's imagining everybody else is pulling out their swords and coming, and what did... What did Jesus do? Put that away. 
puts it back on the guy's head. I know it's not what the world says. See, the world says we're supposed to beat down the competition, right? That's not what the Word says. The Word says that we're to be for one another, not against one another. I know there's some Pittsburgh Steeler fans here, and I'm sorry because I've witnessed some of the drama that's been happening around one of their star players. It saddened me this week to hear that some of the other players were told by their coach, we're going to put up with his off-the-field behavior because of what he can do for us on the field. <laughs> that broke my heart. I know the Steelers have won some championships, but they're not going to win anymore, not with that attitude. They let someone break their culture because of what he could do on the field. That's just wrong. That can't happen in the church, and unfortunately it's happened far too often. We have to raise the standard. We have to raise the standard. So what do champions believe? What do we unite around? I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, but we'll touch on them in the next few weeks. We rally around some very, very simple principles. We actually have a cheer. We have a theme song. Here it is. You can write it in your notes. We have a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission, which will develop a championship culture. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will develop a championship culture. You want to fill that in, you want to remember that statement. Because as champions, we have to commit ourselves to what? To what Jesus said in the Word. This is our commitment. Don't don't believe it because I say it. Don't believe it because somebody in your life group said it. Believe it because it's in here. Don't take anything I say at face value. Check it out with this thing. This is our authority. This is our place. It's our resource. A great commitment to the great commandment. What's the great commandment? We're going to read it together. You've probably heard it, but Jesus is speaking. When Jesus talks, we pay attention. He says in verse 37, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. That's called worship. Okay? Worship isn't something we do in a song. It's not something we do on a Sunday morning. Worship is all of us. It's all the time. Worship is an all the time thing. That's the first part of the great commandment. A second is equally important, Jesus said. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Now, I've told you this before. I'm a pretty simple guy. Um, this is an intimidating book. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in here. But didn't Jesus just give us a great gift? He made it pretty simple, didn't he? He made it real simple. He said, love God and love people. Say that with me. Love God, love people. Okay, I want you to do it this time with no help. Ready? Love God, love people. Wow, you guys are good at this. See, those are the first two purposes of our church. Love God, that's worship. Love people, that's called ministry. It's what we unite around. That statement is not up for negotiation in this church, really in any church, but specifically not in this one. (laughs) Love your neighbor as yourself. The second commandment or the second statement is this, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. The great commission. Jesus is ready to ascend into heaven. He's handing the keys over to his disciples. Verse 18 of chapter 28, Jesus came and told his disciples, if you're a disciple of Christ, you can listen up. If you're not there yet, you can just kind of be a third party. But he's speaking to those of you that call yourselves disciples. The the language here, and I'm not going to get into all of the, the, uh, the Hebrew that's here, but here's what he's saying. He's literally saying to all of my disciples, not just those that were there. He's talking to all of us that call ourselves disciples. Jesus told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Let me paraphrase. I kick some butt. Okay? I'm in charge. I'm king. I have all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach those new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you and to be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. You see, he tells us of his power. I've won. He tells of his power, and then he tells of his promise and then he gives us his presence. You see, we have everything we ever need to love God, love people, and the third purpose is is to make disciples. 
to make disciples. I'm so excited next week. I forgot to mention this at the first service, and I'm kicking myself. Next week, as of right now, we have four people that are going to get baptized right over here. We have four people that have come and said, you know, I, I've made a decision, and I want to give my life to Christ, and I want to make it public by getting baptized. That's worth clapping for. Now, maybe you're in a similar place. Maybe you thought, you know, I'd like to get baptized, but it doesn't seem like the river is open for baptisms. Well, it's not. It's going to be open here. If you've ever thought about getting baptized and you would like to do that, take one of the cards. There's a, mark, there's a place in the back. Just check, I want to be baptized. And we can do it next week. Okay, We're going to do it right here. It's a big deal. It's what we do. It's why we do. We love God, love people, and make disciples. Okay? Are you with me so far? Now, if you don't agree with those, um, I would encourage you, come and talk to me. Let, let's talk about it. If you don't agree with them, that's okay. It won't be a long conversation, though, because I'll tell you about some other churches where you can go, and maybe their principles are up for debate. I don't know. <laughs> but ours aren't because they're right here. Jesus gave them to us. Love God, that's worship. Love people, that's ministry. And then make disciples of all nations. That's what we do. That's who we are. That's what we rally around and unite around. I want to just finish with three, just three quick points of things that we value here at Celebrate. The first one is family. We value family. Now, I know all of us come from different families, and a lot of them, if they're like mine, can be a little dysfunctional, okay? Family sometimes gives us this poor perception, but we're about the family of God. Ephesians 2 says this, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. Listen to this. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. We are carefully joined together in him. Becoming a holy temple for the Lord through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of his dwelling, of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. You see, we're a family, a spiritual family. I don't know the brokenness you come from, but I know this. God is building a family that will be forever, an eternal family, holy and unblemished, and we get to be a part of that. So we are better together. We're a family. Say that with me. We are better together. The greatest gift of our family, by the way, is our diversity. We love diversity at Celebrate. We need diversity at Celebrate. In fact, the greatest strength of our church will be the diversity that we have. I think one of the great weaknesses of living in this community is that it's 97% Caucasian. <laughs> this community, when you do the stats, is 97% white folks. I can tell when you sing that you're white. <laughs> okay, I'm serious. Like the music here, like this is this is you singing. I mean, it's not for, for a lot of you. Maybe it's not pleasant, but I'm telling you, we don't got a lot of rhythm because we don't got a lot of soul. And so when we have people that come to our church who are of a different race or a different skin color, we need to embrace that. We need to embrace that. I was, I was meeting with a friend of mine who happens to be uh, about, I don't know, 50 shades darker than I am. And we were talking about it. And he's going to come and he's going to talk about it because guess what? The church is multicolored. It's diverse. There's a lot of strengths in Brandon. There's a ton of strengths in our community. But you know the greatest weakness? Is that we all kind of look the same. For the most part. The beauty of this place will be the diversity the beauty of this place. There's a reason that we have gray paint in the building. Like, have you noticed that? It's gray. Do you know why? Because we're not trying to draw attention to the walls. We're trying to draw attention to God's creation, his people. And his people come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. Amen? Amen. So we're a family, okay? We're a family. And I'm excited. We're going to talk more about this uh, throughout, throughout the next year. But we're a family. We're also sending. We're a sending church. I was told this one time by a coach. He said, it's much better to say whoa than giddy up, okay? 
It's much better to say, whoa, than giddy up. We're about action. We're about movement. That's what champions are. They're compelled to send. We've been sent, therefore, we must be sent. We've been sent here, we must send others. Okay, that's why we tell you every week the church doesn't start when you arrive. It starts when you leave. Okay, we're a sending church. This will not be a holy huddle. Okay, and I know we can tend to do that, but trust me, as long as I have any kind of opportunity to, to lead here, I'm going to make sure that we're not a holy huddle. Okay, <laughs> I like breaking up holy huddles. So if you're in a holy huddle right now, I, I apologize. I might step on your toes. Um, but we're ascending church. We're about reaching out to others. We have a bias towards action. And the third one is this, you can write it in, is we are a local church. We're a local church. Pastor Keith is going to be here next week. He is, he's my pastor. So you maybe have wondered, maybe you've never wondered, but who's the pastor's pastor? Well, Pastor Keith is my pastor. He's my friend. He's my mentor. Um, he's been a, a huge influence in my life. And I asked him, I said last summer, I was like, you've got to come. You've got to come out to Brandon because a lot of you, some of you know him, but a lot of you don't. You've never met Pastor Keith. I want you to get to meet him and get to know his heart. He's going to preach on something that I've heard him preach for 15 years, and I'm sure, like, Chad and Jamie, you've probably heard him preach this for 20 years, <laughs> right? What did Jesus do? I, I won't tell you. I'll leave a little cliffhanger. What did Jesus do? He only did three things. And so next week, I want to invite you to come back. It would honor, it would honor me. If you were here uh, to warmly receive Pastor Keith, he's going to share out of God's word, and I, I, think, I think I know what he's going to talk about. Um, but he, he is. He's going to talk about the three things that Jesus did. But we're a local church. The reason I left Celebrate in Sioux Falls, there's only one reason. It's because God called me to. We're a local church. The local church is the hope of the world because we were a not local church. We were a Sioux Falls church that was meeting in Brandon. And guess what? That wasn't working out too good. It was August of 2015. We were doing a, we were at the PAC. We were meeting there. And uh, I have to tell you this story because it's the importance of being local. We were, we, were, uh, we were doing a promotion and Sioux Falls was doing a promotion to encourage the USF football team. That whole team pretty much comes to, to celebrate in, in Sioux Falls. And I love USF just like everybody else loves USF, except with a few exceptions, you Augie folks, you know. They seem to beat you a lot, so I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Is that out loud? Sorry. Anyway, um, so they were doing a big thing because all the football players and the coaches from USF came to celebrate. So we were going to sell T-shirts for $5, and then if you showed up at their first game, which nobody ever goes to, um, if you, showed, you bought a T-shirt for 5 bucks, you you'd go to the game, you'd get in free. So it was kind of a way for us to encourage these young people uh, to show them that you've got love, but it was also a way to just kind of you know, do a family church event. Well, we did that in Brandon. And so Pastor Dave was up on the stage telling everybody all about it. I was out in the Welcome Center um, in the PAC there. I was selling T-shirts. And they weren't going real fast. I was like, oh, well, that's, you know, it's kind of slow. And uh, a, a, young, a lady came up to me and she said, John, you know, no one's going to that, right? And I said, no. Why? And she said, John, that's that next Saturday is the pigskin classic. And I looked at her and said probably the most foolish thing that I could have said at that point, what's the pigskin classic? <laughs> and for those of you that call Brandon home, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, the pigskin classic is like the thing in the fall. It's the kickoff to the whole year. Um, and I didn't know what it was. And I just remember her turning and walking away, like this thought bubble over her head. This guy is a buffoon. <laughs> And I, I might be a buffoon, that might be correct, but I, the reason we didn't know about it is because we weren't local. All of the decisions for our church were being made in Sioux Falls. Everybody slept in Sioux Falls. Nobody in the church, even myself and the others that were serving here, most of us didn't live here at that time. And so our pastor, we started talking about that, and our pastor's like, you know what? We need a local church to reach local people. And so that's the point when God began to move in our heart and we moved to Brandon and you know three years later this is what you know we're, we're here it's about local churches the local church is the hope of the world 
and we do it together. And so that's our, that's our DNA. And so we're going to talk about this idea of champion over the next few weeks. So what I want to do um, is I'm going to pray in just a minute, but I want to tell you about what's going on. Next week is our baptism, next Sunday, February 3rd. Baptism, we don't know what service it'll be at, so if you're interested, make sure that you mark this card. Uh, we want to make sure we get you a t-shirt and communicate with you everything we need to communicate before baptism. Um, the next thing that's coming up is February 10th, so that's two weeks from today. We're going to have our Class 101, which is basically, uh, it's two hours, and it's just a teaching. It gives you the opportunity um, to see what it means to be engaged in a part of the local church. Uh, some other churches call it membership. We don't like to call it that, um, but it's our first step in becoming part of the church body. That's next, um, next or two Sundays from now, February 10th at 1 p.m. February 24th, that's a month away, we're going to have class 101, same class, at 4 p.m. Okay, so you don't have to go to both of them. You can pick one or the other. 4 o'clock, February 24th, we're having class 101. Um, if you would, just RSVP, let us know that you're coming. We'd love to make preparations. We'll have light snacks. We won't do a meal, but we'll have snacks and stuff. Um, those are two dates. Um, if child care is something that you need some help with, if you're curious about, just let us know on the card. Just write that on here, and we can, we'll connect with you and make arrangements for that, okay? Does that sound good? All right, so baptism next week, and then we have class 101 um, those next weeks. Uh, I'm just going to close in prayer, um, and as I do that, I just want to encourage you. I'm so glad to be here, and I believe God's got you here for a reason. I believe there's something that he needs you to be a part of within his body, and this is the perfect place to do it. So uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, and I thank you for the example of your son, Jesus. Father, thank you for the commandment that he gave us and the commission that we share with those first disciples. Father, we need you. This life isn't meant to be done alone. We're to do it together. And so, Father, I just pray that over the next four weeks, you would break our hearts, that you would mend them, and that you would form them in your likeness, and that as a church we would rally together, that we would be an encouragement to one another, that we wouldn't be chest-pounding, but that we would be back-patting people that we would be known as Barnabas was for his encouragement. Father, we want to be an encouragement. We want to rally and we want to unite. We want to be united underneath your banner. And then, Father, we, we want to surrender to give up our rights for the rights of those who are yet to know you. And then we're going to fight. That's what champions do. So, Father, give us the strength. We want to receive it today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pray that you have a fantastic day and uh, that you go and live victoriously for him. Have a great day.